Too loud. Um, you're entirely right. Okay. What is, I'm not going to say the sorting, what is Rowling doing? What have we been led to believe about the houses from book one on? Who are we meant to identify with? Gryffindor. Gryffindor, right? Because they're supposed to be the good guys. They're supposed to be the good guys. I mean, that's where Harry is. It's where Hermione is. It's where Ron is. It's where Sirius was. It's where James was. We're not going to talk about it, but what do we see of James and Sirius in book five? They're bullies. They're little Dracos. Bigger Draco, whatever. They're Dracos in their own year kind of thing. I mean, they were jerks, okay? Which house is the most looked down upon? Unless you're not a, you know, <laughs> secret Slytherin, you know, admirer or whatever. But generally, it's Hufflepuff. Why? What one word could we use, even though it's not used in the books, what one word would generally kind of be used in our culture to describe them? Losers. They're the losers. They're the last ones picked. Okay? So, good Hufflepuff, she took the rest and taught them all she knew. Thus the houses and their founders retained friendships firm and true. So Hogwarts worked in harmony. New idea. Okay? Harmony, musical term. Again, for several happy years. Third time, second time, that we're told it only, this harmony only lasted for several years. But then discord crept among us, feeding on our faults and fears. Notice discord is spelled D-I-S-C-O-R-D, not D-I-S-C-H-O-R-D. Discord, C-H-O-R-D, would imply what? Musical. It goes against the harmony. Okay. But this, this kind, this doesn't refer to a musical term. This is related to that as in that. Dis heart. Broken heart. Okay. Discord crept among us, feeding on our faults and fears. What kind of faults? What is meant by faults? Is it meant sins kind of faults? Errors kind of faults? Prejudices. Louder? Prejudices. Prejudices, possibly. I think there's another fault to turn. We'll see. The houses that, like Pillars 4, had once held up our school, now turned upon each other and, divided, sought to rule. So, Gryffindor wanted to have top spot. Hufflepuff, it's implied, wanted to have top spot. Ravenclaw, etc. And for a while, it seemed the school must meet an early end, what with dueling and with fighting and the clash of friend on friend. And at last there came a morning when old Slytherin departed. And though the fighting then died out... So it implies Slytherin was the source of the discord. Implies. It doesn't state it. Okay. When old Slytherin departed, and though the fighting then died out, he left us quite downhearted. So let me go back to faults. Faults and fears. Okay. What is another meaning for the word fault? A more technical meaning. Insecurity? No. I'm from California. Yeah. What's one of the things California is known for? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Earthquakes occur along what? Oh, Fault lines. These are cracks in the tectonic plates. And the earthquakes either move this way or they move this way. Where the land either goes like this, when there's an earthquake, when, it, when the fault ruptures, or it moves like this, okay? But then discord crept among us, feeding on our faults. 
What's meant by false? What's another possible meaning of false there? The, the cracks between them. What are the cracks? Ah, we're only going to take the most cunning. We're only going to take the bravest. We're only going to take the smartest. What are you doing when you do that? You create lines that do what? Separate. That divide. Rather than, I'll teach the lot. No division there. No separation. Okay? So, Slytherin leaves. And I know, it's been more than 10 minutes. Slytherin leaves. Notice, what is a heart made of? It has four chambers. Okay. So you have Slytherin, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff. Slytherin leaves. One of the chambers stops working, and what does the heart do? It, does. it goes into cardiac arrest. See, I think this is, I don't think I'm reading this into this. I could be wrong. I think Rowling wants us to see this kind of imagery. So what happens? He left us quite downhearted, brokenhearted, okay? And never since the Founders Four were whittled down to three have the houses been united as they once were meant to be. Hold on, Good. we're gonna get to another point where I can say what I wanna say. And now the sorting head is here, and you all know the score. Again, musical term. You know how the song goes. I sort you into houses because that is what I'm for. But this year I'll go further. Listen closely to my song. Though condemned I am to split you, still I worry that it's wrong. Who is the you that the sorting hat is condemned to split. Students. Which students? All of them. Well, this nope, year, not all of them. First years. first years who are now, at this point, before the sorting has begun, what? Together. They're all one group. All one group. They're, They're just years. first years. But what are they going to be after the next five minutes? Gryffindor's Raven. And notice the language the hat uses. I'm going to split you. How does the sorting hat split them? We get an example when we see Harry. Put the hat on in, hat on in book one. What's the hoarding set or sorting hat, whichever you prefer. What does the sorting hat tell Harry? You do well in Slytherin. How? He has great ambition, right? He has a thirst to prove himself. He has raw talent, not a bad mind, okay? But it puts him in Gryffindor. Why? That's what he wants to do. That's what he chooses. So what is the sorting head doing when it goes on each person's head? It takes into account what they want. Takes into account what they want? It's kind of testing you. It's testing? In a sense of speaking. Because Right. It's testing. Another word for testing is trying, proving. What do you do when you try something, when you prove something? All these terms, test, try, and prove, they all go back to alchemy. Okay. What is the kind of tube that you use to put chemicals in? It's a test tube, right? Okay. So what are you doing when you do that? You are dissolving stuff into solution. You are separating components. What's the sorting hat actually do to each student? It split. It analyzes. Mm -hmm. When you analyze something, what do you do? You break it into its constituent elements. Mm -hmm. The sorting hat splits each student to say, ah, 
You're, you have more bravery, more courage, more chivalry than anything else. You belong in Gryffindor. What's that mean for the students' other qualities? Because it's anybody 100% courage. No, they're not. No. We find out later on, where did the sorting hat want to put Hermione? Very but it puts her in Gryffindor instead. Okay? So notice what the sorting hat has to do. It splits people. Why? Because Rowling is introducing the idea of splitting. What is being split when the sorting hat does that? Is it just the mind? It's the whole person. Well, what's the person within this? The soul. Notice, condemned I am. If you are condemned, that word literally means what? Damned with. If you are damned, what does that mean? Ultimately means death. So when the sorting hat does the splitting, it's kind of like a little killing because it's saying these other parts of you, they're unimportant. What is this book entirely about? Choices. What kind of choices? What does Dumbledore introduce Harry to? That book seven, Harry has to look for Horcruxes. What are the Horcruxes? They're, the They're the split pieces of Voldemort that he splits himself. The sorting head's doing splitting too, okay? So, condemned I am to split you still, I worry that it's wrong. Though I must fulfill my duty and must quarter every year. Quarter. I've got to draw, I've got to divide the incoming students into quarters. That implies equal. It's not like 27% go into Gryffindor and therefore, you know, 23% go into Ravenclaw to make an, evil fifth, an even 50. It's 25, 25, 25, 25, okay? Quarter. What phrase do we have from history that has the word quarter in it? It's a term for condemning to death. You will be drawn and quartered, cut into quarters. So, condemned I am to split you still, I worry that it's wrong, though I must fulfill my duty and must quarter every year. Still, I wonder whether sorting may not bring the end I fear. What's the end that the sorting head fears? It's the destruction of Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. Know the perils, read the signs. The warning history shows. For our Hogwarts is in danger <coughs> from external deadly foes. And we must unite inside her or will crumble from within. What did Christ say that Abraham Lincoln then reiterated during the Civil War? A house divided within itself can not stand. A house, a university, a college, Hogwarts, divided cannot stand. Well, it is divided, right? Slytherin's gone off. What's the implication? Even though there is a house called Slytherin, Hogwarts has been divided all these years, nearly a thousand. Okay? So, what is that hat telling the students? If Slytherin doesn't come back, it's going to fall. Yeah, or another way of putting it, because Slytherin can't come back, right? I mean, yeah. He's dead. <laughs> Not going to raise him up from the dead and such. 
So what else does it mean? Unless Gryffindor and Slytherin, as an example, do what? Make peace. How do we know that's what's intended? Because there's going to be a conversation between Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and Harry's going to say, you mean it makes it wants us to be friends with Malfoy? Jump to the epilogue of book seven. It's the only, I, my opinion, it's the only good thing in that stupid epilogue. Yeah, I'll take that back. There's one other little thing, which kind of shows the cycle, you know, continues, so to speak. Okay, so how important is this song? This song opens us up to this book and book seven. I think it's the most important story in that song. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, entirely. Okay? And it's not just because it's warning about Dolores Jane Umbridge. It's, it's not Umbridge that's the real danger. I mean, Umbridge is a danger. Yes. What's the real danger? Okay, Voldemort, true. What's the real danger? It's not out there. The real danger's inside. The real danger is what? Taking this sorting and believing it's entirely true. That is, believing all Slytherins are rotten to the core, as Hagrid would say about the Malfoys. Bad blood. Yes, most dark wizards have come out of Slytherin. Have all of them? No. Who's a big one that we could name? Who was a Gryffindor? Peter Pettigrew. Are there some good Slytherins? Good being a relative term, okay? Well, we're going to get to the end of book seven, and we're going to find out. Yeah, there is one at least. He's a dirty, rotten SOB, but is still ultimately good, okay? Now, go from there, skipping everything else, to... Not that page. That page. They've had the raid on the ministry. Sirius is dead. Sorry for those of you who haven't finished it. Sirius is dead. When Rowling finished the book, by the way, writing it, she said in an interview, um, before it was published, before we could get our hands on it, she was interviewed, and she mentioned, you know, coming downstairs to her husband, Tears just running down her face. I killed him, I killed him, I had to kill him. She said something like that. Okay, didn't let anybody know who, who it was going to be. Okay, so end of year feast has happened. Harry is still wrestling with Sirius's death. He's had his big long talk with Dumbledore. Dumbledore says the fact that you're suffering and crying, that you know shows you're still human. It shows you're still a man, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Harry doesn't want to hear any of that, etc. So, page 860, he finally comes to this realization. There's a lot of dead people walking around the college or the school, right? Nearly had this Nick, Bloody Baron, and others. He decides to talk to Nick. Nick says, you know, kind of been expecting this expecting what you to find me you know what happens when someone's suffered a loss he, well I have come to find you he says um you're dead but you're still here yep uh you can walk around Hogwarts yep so you came back what is Harry's question or comment you came back didn't you imply I mean about Nick. Leave Sirius out for just a moment. He was gone. He was gone. You really went through the door and then you reopened it and came back. No. Not everyone can come back as a ghost. What do you mean? 
Only wizard. That's not a problem. He's a wizard. He won't come back. Who? Sirius Black. Nick's telling us, I know what you're getting at, Harry. But you did. You came back. You're dead. You didn't disappear. Wizards can leave an imprint of themselves upon the earth to walk palely where their living selves once trod. That's kind of the dictionary definition, modern world, our real world, of what people believe ghosts are. Usually it's in line with they've got unfinished business, something to attend to, and then they leave. Okay? But very few wizards chose to choose that path. Why not? Why not come back? Sirius will. I know he will. Okay? He will not come back. He will have... Stay there. Stop. He will have gone on. Harry. What do you mean gone on? Gone where? And then it's like the light bulb goes off. For the first time in Harry's now 15-year-old mind. Well, golly gee, Nick. What happens when you die? It's like it's the first time he's ever thought of what really is death? Remember, Dumbledore told him, book one, to the well-organized mind, death is the next great adventure. What did Dumbledore say? How did Dumbledore explain those things that came out of Voldemort's wand in book four? They were echoes, shadows of the real selves. How many of you agree with Dumbledore? What's the problem with Dumbledore's explanation? Harry, when you break the connection, his father tells him, you only have a few minutes. We'll keep him occupied while you get to the port key. That little discussion shows us a whole bunch of stuff. Whatever that was that came out of World War I that looks like Harry's father is present tense and past tense and future tense aware. He's aware of what's happening right now. He's aware of what happened before. And he's aware of what will happen once Harry does this. Echo? Even Frank Bryce has an awareness. He doesn't have a clue who Harry is. Okay? Bertha Jorkins recognizes Harry. Harry's mother comes out. Hold on, Harry. Your father's coming. Okay? By the way, earlier editions of the book, that was reversed. She had James come out first and then his mother. Yes. It was wrong. Yeah. Because they're coming out in reverse order. I've had students who have, I think I've, one of our copies has that, okay? They've, do they live in Voldemort's wand? No. It just regurgitates the last spells that the wand did. And so he sees images, elements, portions, souls of his parents and such. So where do you go? Why doesn't everyone come back? Why isn't this place full of them? I can't, but you're dead. Why can't you answer? I was afraid of death. I chose to remain behind. In other words, nearly headless Nick didn't have what? A well-organized mind. So what's it mean to have a well-organized mind? Notice this is the first book that this idea is introduced to. To not be afraid of death. To not be afraid of death. I think all seven books are about one thing. How to die well. Well meaning prepared. Harry was prepared. Book one. To die. How do we know? He did everything he could to stop Voldemort from getting the Philosopher's Stone. Book two. He was prepared to die. He took on the ghost, if you want, the soul of Voldemort. Book three, he was prepared to die. He saw those Dementors coming from across the lake. Okay? Book four, he was prepared to die. And this is where we see it really manifested. How so? 
They're having the little duel. He runs and he hides behind the gravestone. And what does he tell himself? He's Anybody gonna remember? Die. He's not going to die hiding behind the tombstone. I'm not going to die crouching, begging for mercy. He's going to die like his father did, standing up, facing him. An image we're going to see in book six. Two different ways to die. One, dragged, kicking and screaming into an arena. Or two, marching in, head held up, chest thrust out. Facing death head on. It's all preparing us for book seven. So, Nick says, I chose to remain behind. I am neither here nor, we don't know where the there is. We get a little inkling of it in the chapter King's Cross in book seven, but that's all we get, okay? He says, I don't know anything of the secrets of death. What was one of the rooms Harry went into in the Department of Mysteries in book five? Which was, which one was it? What did it have in it? It was the one with the veil. Notice when they first go into that room, who wants to go check out the veil and what's behind the veil? And who doesn't even like being in the room and wants to leave immediately? Who wants to leave immediately? Why? There wasn't one. Oh. You have to, you kind of have to fish for it. I think that's possible. If she knew what it was, I feel like she could have been thinking ahead of, it's not a good idea for him to be in here. Okay. She's thinking about Harry. Okay. But also, there's a lot of things that could go wrong in that room. Okay. What else? She's afraid of death. What do you mean afraid of? She's like she literally afraid. fears it? What's the problem with death? It's unknowable. Bingo. You can't read a book about it. You can't reason your way through it. Okay? You can only prepare yourself somehow and willingly step through the door. Notice, Harry is drawn to the veil. And I said, Harry, Harry, let's get out. He goes, Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Hey, there's nothing there, Harry. No, there's voices. Okay? So, Harry goes on, page 862. I know I've gone too long, longer than I should have. Nick leaves. Harry felt as almost as though he had lost his godfather all over again. He was putting all his hope on Nick telling him, Ceres can come back. In losing the hope that he might be able to see or speak to him again, he walked slowly and miserably back up through the empty castle, wondering whether he would ever feel cheerful again. So what's all the emphasis on there? Where, where are all of Harry's thoughts in that passage? Serious. They're on himself. His loss, his lack of cheer, his sorrow. It's all on himself. Okay? He runs into Luna. Mm -hmm. And he finds out people have been hiding Luna's stuff. This isn't a first time occurrence. Seemingly this happens every year. They pick on her. Why? Oh, you know, Looney Luna stuff. Okay. And Harry says, that's no reason for them to take your things. Do you want help finding them? What does he immediately start to do? Try to help. Keep going. Looking at other people's. He goes outside of himself. The emphasis is drawn externally. Okay. And she says, no, they'll all come back. They always do in the end. What does that mean? Does her stuff 
magically reappear in her room just in time for her to get on the Hogwarts Express? No, but it implies somehow she always gets everything back in time. So, Harry's like, you heard the voices. Did you know anybody who died? And she says, yes, her mother. One of her spells, experiments went wrong. Harry, I'm sorry. She says, yeah, it was horrible, but it's not as though I'll never see mom again, is it? And Harry's like, what? Uh, isn't it? The isn't it tells us what? Harry doesn't believe that there's anything after death. Harry doesn't believe, or another way of putting it, he's never been taught that there's anything after death. After all, the Dursleys, first paragraph, don't hold to anything strange or mysterious. You have to admit, pick the flavor. Religion is strange and mysterious. It's almost kind of parallel to what Arthur Weasley said in the second book of don't trust anything when you can't see where it keeps its brains. Don't trust anything. The Dursleys kind of like don't trust anything. True. So Arthur, in that sense, is kind of the wizard equivalent of the Dursleys. Kind of. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to take that too far. So she shook her head in disbelief. She can't believe what Harry has just said. Come on. You heard them just behind the veil. What is Luna saying? You heard them. What is that an aspect of? It's a means of knowing. It's empirical. Empirical knowledge is knowledge you get through your senses. She's saying, Harry, you have proof that there's something else. You mean that room with the archway? They were just lurking out of sight. That's all. You heard them. Okay? Priori and cantatum. What does Harry hear and see? Frank Bryce, Bertha Jorgens. <laughs> Wormtail's hand. I mean, it's flopping there on the ground. Cedric. Cedric. Okay. Harry, take my body back. Take my body back to my parents, you know. Your father's coming. He'll make it all right. Okay. Book one, Mirror of Erised. He what? He sees, but he can't hear. He can't touch. They looked at each other. Luna was smiling slightly. Harry did not know what to say or to think. Luna believed so many extraordinary things, you know, the horn crackle snupper lump or whatever the things are. Yet he had been sure he had heard voices behind the veil too. Are you sure you don't want me to help you look for your stuff? He said, oh no, said Luna. No, I think I'll just go down, have some pudding, wait for it all to turn up. It always does in the end. Have a nice holiday, Harry. Yeah, you too. And Harry goes off and notice the description. As he watched her go, he found that the terrible weight in his stomach seemed to have lessened slightly. Why? Because he has hope. He has hope. What has Luna given him? Another word for hope. An up, louder. Oh, I thought you, belief. Belief in what? He doesn't know yet. Notice she looked at him in disbelief. Harry now has some kind of belief. Is he ready to you know, join the local Church of Scotland or something? No. Is he gonna join the Church of England? No. 
Has there been any throughout the books at this, up to this point? Has there been any indication anywhere of any kind of any kind of religion at all? No. How many say no? Show of hands. Put them up. Some are going, eh, I'm not sure there. What was serious to Harry? Godfather is not a secular thing. And it's also, wouldn't you say like the Death Eaters and Voldemort is like similar to like how a cult acts? And that's religious? They're similar to? A cult? Yeah, kind of. Um, I know that's like a religious group. But, I mean, think of serious. Godfather. How does one become a godfather? It's not just, I name you godfather. It is a ritual. It is a ceremony performed in a church. When does it happen? Anybody know? Either in the Anglican church or in the Catholic or the Orthodox or even some, most Protestant churches don't have godfathers, godmothers. They have, you know, sponsors kind of things. They don't, some of them don't do even do baptisms, you know, for children. It's at the baptism of the child. So what are you baptized into? That's only, you know, take the big overarching umbrella term, Christianity. We're going to actually see. Which book is it? Oh, book seven. We're going to see somebody die. And Harry's going to bury a part of that person. And he's going to do something on the tree beneath which he buried the part of that person. It blows my mind every time I read it because I don't understand why. He's going to put a cross with his wand. He's going to carve it on the tree over the part they have of the dead person. Why? Do you think that was some miracle No, no, no. That's entirely intentional. Is that saying the person that Harry, the part that Harry buried, this person was a Christian? Is this Harry saying, I'm a Christian? And this happens before he goes to God himself. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I was about to say, well, you could say it himself, but like. Yep. So. I mean, having grown up, not necessarily in a religious household, but in a religious society. Very much so. It's It would seem unlikely that when he was in school um, before Hogwarts, that he wouldn't have seen any kind of religious symbolism at all, and it wouldn't have made any kind of implant, uh, effect on him. That's one of my questions, or, or one of the issues that I kind of wrestle with in reading the books. Rowling kind of creates, let's say, a parallel Britain to the real Britain. And I don't mean the, the wizarding one. I mean the muggle version that she creates here. With the Dursleys, at least. It sounds like Harry is raised in a sterile environment in terms of any kind of religious beliefs whatsoever. And that he's never experienced any kind of religious symbolism. I mean, he obviously, he knows what Christmas is. He knows what Easter is. And it, a little tangent, it's kind of interesting that all throughout the books, the quote-unquote winter break is called what? Christmas holidays. Christmas holidays. The spring break is called what? Easter They're Easter holidays. They're always referred to as the Easter holidays and the Christmas holidays. They're never, you know, that time of the year that we take a break between the end of one year and the beginning of another year. And some people go and do stuff with the tree and other people do other things with candles and, you know. But Harry's kind of like blank slate when it comes to the meaning of all of that. Notice 
when, when we get descriptions of what Peeves kind of does with some of the Christmas decorations and, and such, you know, and bastardizes, you know, Christmas carols and, and such, um, it rankles Harry every now and then. But we're going to see, not in this book, in book seven, we're going to see a lot more religious symbolism. Churchyard, Christmas carols, etc. I mean, I work with second graders and they know what Christmas is. Oh, yeah. So, but a lot of them, like I have a pin on my lanyard and it says Jesus Christ is real because that's just my beliefs. Um, and a lot of them are like, what does this say? Oh, who is this? Like they don't know who Jesus right. is, but they, of course, know what Christmas is. But it's not that hard of a jump even in our society today. The United States and Britain, England, are very, very different. England is much more what is called post-Christian than the United States is. I mean, the vast majority of Anglican churches are empty. Many of them, I would say probably most of them, are now used for non-church purposes. They've been sold for various other things. Okay, it's Something like only 3%, I think it is something like only 3% of English consider themselves Christian. Right? I mean, so she's kind of writing within that tradition. So, here he ends this book, having lost. How did Dumbledore describe Sirius to Harry? The closest thing he had to a parent. Okay. So Harry's lost his parents. He lost Sirius. This book, he's going to lose somebody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next book, it's going to start just death and destruction. And, and notice with the next book, seven, we're going to see more of that ring structure that I talked about or envelope structure where you have book one paralleled with book seven. Book one, it begins with Harry coming to number four privet drive as a baby with nothing and when he leaves number four privet drive and gets to his destination he will have nothing again not saying anything not giving anything away but he will have nothing including something that he has had for seven books okay so look how this one opens this book opened number four privet drive book four didn't Book six, okay, opens where? The other minister. Who is the other minister? Is the other minister the Muggle Prime Minister? Or is the other minister, from the Muggle's perspective, the Minister for Magic? It's beautifully ambiguous. It can be either one, okay? So what do we see? Back up for a moment. What happened very early on in Order of the Phoenix? Harry confronted what? Dementors, right? Dementors in on Privet Drive, okay? Had a discussion with his aunt and uncle in their surgically clean kitchen. And what realization came to Harry? And when did it come? He mentions Dementors. Vernon says, Dementors, what's it? Who defines, describes Dementors? Petunia. What does it do to Harry's mind? What realization does he come to at that point? And what is Rowling doing via that? It. Yeah, partially. What else? So. Wasn't there something there that that was the first time Harry not realized, but for want of a better word, realized that she was his mother's sister? Yes, it is the first time that it really hit. And why am I using two colors? It showed that their worlds were kind of the same well, kind of a more aligned than the two worlds. That Harry inhabits 
are brought together. In other words, they've always been together. Harry's only seen them separately. And now he comes to realize, whoa, I'm not the only one who now knows of this. In other words, the wizarding world crashes in upon the surgically clean kitchen. Well, where else did that happen? Book one, right? Owls, <coughs> letters coming through, okay? Why does Rowling do that? What's the wizarding world in that sense, and it's going to get spelled out, not literally, it's kind of implied, in this book? It's bleeding into the muggle world. It's bleeding in, but what? So if it's bleeding, what is this world? This is our world, right? This is the material world. Physical world, we inhabit. So what's this? It's the immaterial world, the magical world. I'm going to use this. You don't have to. It's the world that can't be rationally known. It can't be objectified. It can't be tested. Okay? How do we know? So the other minister shows up in around page, take seven pages off, three or four. Fudge shows up, says, difficult where to begin. Difficult to know where to begin. How, how do I even start talking to you? And uh, Fudge says, I've been having the same week as you. Prime Minister, had a bad one too, have you? Fudge, I've been having the same week as you. Brockdale Bridge, Bones and Vance murders, the West Country. Those are all what? Those are all things that happened in the magical world, the wizarding world. Uh, you mean to say some of your people were involved in, in those things, were they? Fudge, of course they were. Surely you realize what is going on. What is going on? Voldemort's back. Voldemort's back, all that. Stuff that happens here does what? It influences things that happen here. Okay. So, he goes on and discusses all the things that happen. Who are the Bones and Vance murders? How do we know those names? Susan Bones, who was? At Harry's Louder? At Harry's, At Harry's hearing. Who asked the question? Can, can you really produce a corporal Patronus? Harry's like, yeah. Really? Yeah. Takes the form of his dad. Always has. Since my third year. And she's like, wow. Okay. She's impressed. What is her position? Head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong. Emily Vance, one of the original members of the Order of the Phoenix. Remember the scene where Matt, the real Mad Eye, shows Harry the photograph? And I don't know if you could see it on the lecture, but I usually I put down a list here. All the original members of the Order of the Phoenix. How many are alive? 50%. And we have a new Order of the Phoenix. And we could kind of go through and say, cross, start crossing out. Who's going to be dead? I've never, I don't think I've ever actually done that. But I'm pretty sure of those that we meet, by the time we get to the end of Book 7, hmm, Maybe 50% are dead, okay? Even some who, shouldn't say that, even some who aren't really technically members of the Order of the Phoenix. So, the other minister, assuming the other minister is the prime minister, says, round bottom of page 10 or so, so it's your fault those people were killed. In other words, this, this isn't my problem. The only problem is 
Yes, it is. Because it has repercussions in his world. Okay? Amelia Bones. Susan Bones is the student. Amelia Bones, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. How are they both killed? Yeah, they're murdered behind locked doors. Kind of stumped us. Yeah, kind of stumped Scotland Yard and such. Okay? So we get introduced to the new minister for magic, Rufus Scrimger. Right? Chapter 2, Spinner's End. What happens? What's the purpose of this chapter? It's to show us a couple of things. What do we what do we see performed pretty early on? Apparition. Okay, what else? Unbreakable vow, right? Mm -hmm. Between Snape and Narcissa Malfoy. Snape and Narcissa Malfoy. Who's the witness? Bellatrix. Bellatrix Lestrange. Or Bellatrix the Strange. That's what her name means. Okay. What's the vow? That Snape will protect Draco, help him in any and perform the deed Draco's in order to do the thing he failed. Bingo. Snape will protect Draco and do the thing the Dark Lord has commanded to Draco to do if Draco is unable to. Okay. What kind of vow is it? What happens if you break it? You die. you die. Okay? We're going to see another unbreakable vow. Or we're going to be told it's unbreakable. In... I can't remember. Is it in this book? No, in book seven. Okay? Who else is there? Servant, <laughs> just that worm tail. Okay. Anything else really important in that chapter? Look at the title. What is Spinner's End? Literally, what is it? It's the name of the street Snape lives on. Okay. Metaphorically, symbolically, what is it? If you've gotten to the end of the book, eh, take that back. If you've gotten to the end of book seven, it might be clear. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. What spins? Top. A top? What else? A spinning wheel. Spinning wheel? What do you do when you use a spinning wheel? You make yarn. You make yarn or thread from wool or cotton. Okay? What else? Pendulum clock? Yeah, they rotate. I don't know that they say they spin. Spiders spin. What do spiders spin? What are the webs for? Okay, just kind of let that. Spinners end. Remember, end has two meanings. Purpose and consummation, culmination. Conclusion. Okay. Have any of you heard of the Norns or the Fates? There are three Fates in Greek mythology. I think I have them written down in here, but I bet I bought. Brought the wrong book. Yep, I don't. Can't remember the three names. Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropo. I think those are the three. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of them spins thread. One of them measures thread. And Atropo cuts thread. Mm -hmm. What are the threads that they spin, measure, and cut? Our lives. Okay? Spinners in. Think of spinner in the sense of the fates spinning our fates 
and spiders spinning webs. What must the spider know when it spins its web? Or what must be going on in its mind, assuming the spider has sentience? Does a spider spin a web someplace where there's not going to be any bugs? No, it's got to be someplace where it's going to attract or catch bugs. Okay, so it's got a purpose in that sense. What will be caught? It's prey. Okay, just let all that sit. Don't know if I should go here or not. Has anyone been spinning webs kind of since the beginning? Not literal webs, metaphorical webs. Has anyone kind of been pushing pieces into place? Oh, you did do the thing rightly, Dumbledore says to Harry at the end of book one. Okay? Spinners in. Just let that sit. Some of you, I think, are seeing where I'm going. If you're familiar with the books. So... One of, the thing, one of the things Snape says in this chapter, and I'm not going to point to the exact page. Um, he talks about something that's happened to Dumbledore. Anybody know what it is or remember what it is? It's his injury? It's his injury. Where does Snape, or when does Snape say he got it? His duel with the Dark Lord. Uh, that's right? about the no, no, that comes later. Because well, okay. we don't know about that yet. My bad, I that's, that's okay. He says the duel with the Dark... Minus six pages. Uh, somewhere around page 30. He says the duel with the Dark Lord last month shook him. He has since sustained a serious injury because his reactions are slower than they once were. Okay? We don't know what that injury is. Notice, the duel with the Dark Lord shook him. Go back for a moment to the end of book five. Did Dumbledore ever appear shaken mm -hmm. in that duel? By the way, if you've seen the film, I do remember this part, was this duel anything like what is shown in the film? Not really. I mean, we're stuff exploding and blowing up every. No, Dumbledore's pretty much just doing what? I mean, it's like he's conducting an orchestra. It's Voldemort is the one who's frantic and hectic and all that kind of stuff. Okay, will and won't. So we. See Harry, beginning of the chapter, we read about Harry as the chosen one, okay? We read about Scrimger succeeding Fudge. We get the nice little pamphlet from the Ministry for Magic about how to protect yourselves against the Dark Lord and his evil minions. When did this book come out? Anybody know? This book came out 2005. Order of the Phoenix came out 2003. What was um, Moody's two-word motto? Constant, Constant vigilance. vigilance. In 2005, which was when this film came out, in 2005, when I taught my Harry Potter course in London, the day we flew over was the day of the London tube bombings and bus bombings. Mm -hmm. July 7th, 2005. Okay. Woke up that morning to a call from the uh, MTSU study abroad people saying, don't do anything as of right now, you're still going. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, literally, it's like a phone call at 5.30 in the morning. You're not, awa you're not watching? It's like, no, it's 5.30 in the morning. Turn on the news. And we saw the stuff about what was going on in London. Okay. Flew that evening, arrived in London July 6th, and London was like I had never seen it before. I mean, cops walking four abreast down a sidewalk that's this wide. So one, two, three, four, taking up the entire sidewalk, and all of them carrying semi-automatic weapons. Okay, you never see a cop with a weapon in London. 
And here, every cop was carrying the semi-automatic weapon. Seeing snipers on major buildings on major thoroughfares. And not just one, but like every building would have a sniper on it. And getting in the tube and each carriage having literally a sign that said constant vigilance. Mm -hmm. It was like walking, in, it was perfect. I mean, it was great for teaching Harry Potter because it was like, wow, the Dark Lord is alive and well, you know, okay? So what's the purpose for the chapter will and won't? What's it referred to? Will and won't. Okay. Sirius left Harry everything. So not only does he have a pot of gold, you know, in Gringotts, he now has this big massive house and a slave. Okay. So Dumbledore is coming to pick Harry up and he shows up and welcomes himself into the house because they don't welcome him in. This is around page 44 or so. And Vernon starts to say, I don't mean to be rude. And Dumbledore finishes his sentence for him. Yet, sadly, accidental rudeness occurs alarmingly often. Nice, you know, jocular way of saying, then just shut up. So you won't be rude. Okay. And he sits down with the Dursleys. He conjures creature. Creature comes. Harry gives him an order. Creature obeys. So they've got that part taken care of. So now Dumbledore wants to have a talk with the Dursleys. Round page 52 or so. Okay. They all sit down. The three Dursleys on the couch. Harry in a chair. Dumbledore in another chair. And Dumbledore says... Harry comes of age in a year's time. He's 16, he'll be 17 next year. Petunia says, no, Dumbledore, I'm sorry, you're telling me I'm wrong. He doesn't, he's a month younger than Dudley. Dudley doesn't turn 18 until the year after next. Yeah, but wizards come of age when they're 17, okay? So, he talks about Voldemort and he says, I left him upon your doorstep 15 years ago with a letter explaining about his parents' murder and expressing the hope that you would care for him as though he were your own. I hoped you would treat Harry like you treat Dudley. Okay? That really that much of a bad thing that they didn't treat like that. That's, hold on, hold on. Dumbledore pauses. He lets his words kind of hang there. You did not do as I asked. You have never treated Harry as a son. He has known nothing but neglect and often cruelty at your hands. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why Harry has strength of character and can so easily repel an imperious charm. The best thing that can be said is that he has at least escaped the appalling damage you have inflicted upon the unfortunate boy sitting between you. In other words, kind of like, thank God that you didn't do as I asked. Because if they had, Harry would be what? Dudley, Dudley Jr. He would be like Dudley. They look at each other. Mistreat Dutters? What do you mean? The magic I evoked 15 years ago, and he explains what will happen. This magic will cease to operate the moment Harry turns 17. In other words, the exact stroke of the clock. The moment he becomes a man. I ask only this. You allow Harry to return once more to this house before his 17th birthday. So when's that once more? Christmas holidays, Easter holiday, end of the year? Next summer. 
We're not told at this point, but it will be at the end of the school year. Okay. None of the Dursleys said anything. Dudley was frowning slightly, trying to work out how he's been mistreated. Vernon looks as though he has something stuck in his throat, and Aunt Petunia was oddly flushed. What does that mean, she's flushed? What's happened to her face? She's embarrassed. She's red. Is she, what did you say? Embarrassed. embarrassed? I think, did you say something else? No. Embarrassed or ashamed? Both? Both. Why? She knows he's right. Why else? She was like blatantly called out on it. Okay. Then Lily was her sister. Sister's son. Yeah. Harry is what? Her nephew. Keep going. What? Keep going. Last remaining of her sister. And we could jump almost to the end of book seven when someone says, look into my eyes where we see, somebody got it, where we see somebody see the last remaining vestige of Lily Potter, okay? Horse Slughorn. We're going to skip. Yes. Sure. Had Petunia and Vernon treated Harry's teacher Dursley, he would have been a lot more like Draco. Yeah. Like possibly. Possibly. In, in a sense. Yeah, I, yeah, I think he would be a he he would likely be more bully-ish. I think he would probably be still as ignorant of the wizarding world. Yeah, I don't think they would have told him all of that. Okay? Um, but that's again, it's all speculation. He probably would have fell in with Malfoy. He could have easily, easily, yeah. When Malfoy was like, I'll show you who the right people are, he would have been okay. He would have identified because he would have grown up being part of Dudley's gang. Okay? He probably would have been more like Crabbe Boyle, but like somewhere. Yeah, but he's still not big and bulky like Crabbe oh, Boyle. Yeah. So, so, what's the purpose of the Horse Slughorn chapter? To introduce Horace. Introduce the Slughorn. Gets Harry to kind of work on Slughorn to help Dumbledore get Slughorn to come to teach at Hogwarts. Why does Dumbledore want Slughorn to teach at Hogwarts? Why does Dumbledore want Slughorn to teach at Hogwarts? Because he wants something. He wants something that Slughorn has. It's a plot device. How important is Slughorn after Harry gets what's needed from him? Just discard him. Okay. Excess of phlegm. Next chapter. What's the purpose? We find out Fleur is going to marry Bill Weasley. We find out how Harry did on his exams and such. Okay. How does everybody think? What does everybody think of Fleur? They call her Flynn. <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, uh, Hermione's not. Um, oh, notice, G yeah, Jenny, Hermione, Mrs. Weasley. Fred, George, Ron, are they all that excited? No, they, they like to look at her, but they don't like being around they her. They like to look at her because she's nice looking, but yeah, her personality is not all that winning. Gross. Not yet. We see the real Fleur come out in book seven. Draco's detour. We find ourselves going back into Borgen and uh, Bergen and Bork, Borgen and Randick. I always get that mixed up, okay? And Harry spies, and we see Harry have a nice little conversation, I'm not gonna talk about it because we don't have time, with Narcissa Malfoy, where she kind of implies some things, and Harry implies some things. She says, she calls Harry essentially Dumbledore's pet and says what? No, that's when she says, you know, Dumbledore won't always be around. First thing, Slug Club. Okay. 
only reason the slug club chapter is important is because of what happens at the end. It has nothing to do with the slug club. How Slughorn likes to gather important students. That totally gets dropped. Okay. What's the important thing that happens? Harry gets caught. He relies too much on what he thinks are his brains and the invisibility cloak. And what do we see Malfoy do? It's a very famous image from literature. Well, in history, Orwell painted this image for us of the jackbooted thug stomping on the face of the enemy. Notice that's not just a punch. When he stomps on Harry's face, what's that showing? He's below him. He's below him. This is what's going to happen to all those who oppose. Malfoy and those Malfoy answers to bad faith, etc. Okay, so on Thursday, I wanted to get us up to 200, but I'm it's not a problem. On Thursday, we're going to pick up with Snape Victorious because what does Snape finally have? The job. Has the job he's applied for. For 15 years now. Yep. All right.